from Revelation. John writes, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Angels worship. They worship God Almighty who sits on the throne. They worship the Lamb who was slain, who now lives and reigns forever. And it's not just a few angels that worship. No, thousands upon thousands, myriads upon myriads, a number so great that no one can count. And their worship is ceaseless. Their worship is never-ending. As they sing, holy, 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 to the Lord whose glory fills both heaven and earth. Now we don't worship the angels because like us, the angels are created beings. But what we do is we join with the angels in worshiping our creator. You see, every time we worship, we never worship alone. As we sung earlier, God himself is present. We are standing on holy ground when we worship. And not only is God present when we worship, but so are the holy angels. As we gather here in worship, we are stepping into eternity, joining with the angels and the archangels and the entire company of heaven, our brothers and sisters in Christ who are already with the Lord in that never-ending worship to our glorious God. Now, the worship of the angels, it never ends. It's perfect. It's ceaseless. Yes, indeed, the angels, they do worship perfectly. Now, on this side of glory, our worship must begin and end. And our worship is far from perfect. How often we forget that when we worship, we are standing in the presence of God, that God himself is present, that we are to, like the angels always do, worship with reverence and awe, for God is in this his temple. And how often when we worship is our worship half-hearted, not a worshiping with reverence and awe, not a worshiping in spirit and in truth, but we become easily distracted, forgetting who is in our midst as we worship. Well, this morning as we celebrate the ministry of the angels, it's an opportunity for us to confess the times when our worship has been half-hearted, when we've been easily distracted, when we've forgotten Who's in our midst? God himself and his holy angels. And today, the opportunity to lift our voices, to join with the angels in their ceaseless worship to the God who was, who is, and, to, and who is to come, our Savior, the Lord Almighty. Hymn 949. <laughs>
A scripture reading from the Gospel of St. Luke. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The word angel literally means messenger. And often God deploys his angels to to deliver messages. And indeed, when God sends his angels to deliver a message, great things are about to happen. Take, for example, the incarnation and the birth of our Lord. God himself becoming flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. An angel, the angel Gabriel, appears to Zechariah in the temple, announcing that he and his wife Elizabeth in their old age will have a son, and not just any son, John the Baptist, the one who will prepare the way for the coming Messiah. Six months later, God again sends the angel Gabriel to earth, this time to Mary in Nazareth to tell her that she has been chosen by God to be the mother of the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world, the King whose kingdom will never end. Of course, when Joseph hears that Mary is pregnant and he is not the father, he wants to end everything, divorce her quietly. So God sends an angel with another message, this time to Joseph. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And the angel even tells Joseph what to name the son. Give him the name Jesus, which means Savior, the Lord saves, because that is what he's going to do. Save his people from their sins. And then we all know what happened that first Christmas. Again, God sending his angel to deliver that good news of great joy to the shepherds that today in the city of David the Savior has been born and he is Christ the Lord. And where to find him? This baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And then the shepherds have the opportunity to catch this glimpse of heaven, to see this ceaseless heavenly worship as the sky is filled with the heavenly host, with the angelic army praising and glorifying and worshiping God. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Yes, God sends his angels to deliver messages. And the messages that the angels proclaim are messages for you and me. Indeed, we hear the Christmas angels and we rejoice. Christ is born for you. Christ is born for me. We hear the Christmas angels sing, and we know that peace of which they sing is for you and for me. Peace with God. Peace because our sins are forgiven through that baby born in Bethlehem. Eternal peace when we will join with the saints and angels before the throne of God. Yes, the word angel literally means messenger. But what's fascinating about the New Testament, uh, written in Greek. In the Greek language, the word angel doesn't just refer to spiritual beings, heavenly beings, like in English, that deliver messages. In Greek, the word angel both refers to spiritual beings who deliver messages, but also to people. So, for example, John the Baptist is called an angel of the Lord. A messenger, because he's delivering the message to prepare the way for the Lord. So, do you want to be an angel? Because there's a way to do it. Not obviously in the way that the heavenly beings are angels, 
But when you speak the good news of the gospel, when you speak the good news of great joy found in that baby born in Bethlehem, the one who would suffer and die on the cross, the lamb who was slain but now lives and reigns, guess what? You're an angel. God is using you as his messenger. So indeed, may we not only raise our voices and worship and praise with the angels, but may we be empowered by the Holy Spirit to truly be angels, to truly be God's messengers, proclaiming that message of life and salvation, forgiveness and peace through Christ. Hymn 380. From Hebrews. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, 
Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Angels not only deliver messages, they are servants, ministering spirits. Indeed, angels serve God, but even more than that, they serve you and me. Every heir of salvation, every believer, how comforting it is to know that God's angels not only serve him, but the angels are there to serve us. And of course, we need the angels to serve us because not every angel is a good angel. Indeed, the devil convinced some of his angels to rebel against God, and they were cast out of heaven for their rebellion. And now the devil is a roaring lion looking for that opportune time to devour you and me. He and his minions, those fallen angels, the demons, indeed, sending trials and afflictions into our lives, trying to get us to turn our back on God or to doubt his love and mercy and grace, trying to lure us into a deep spiritual sleep so that we become apathetic and indifferent to the things of God, not concerned about our eternal destiny, tempting us so that we become enslaved to sin, trying to trick us and deceive us. So we are misled away from our Lord by false teaching and false doctrine, tempting us to live according to our sinful and selfish flesh instead of seeking to walk according to the Spirit, serving others with Christ-like love. Indeed, Satan and his minions are powerful, a roaring lion. But Christ has crushed the serpent's head. He has won the victory over sin and Satan, and he gives us the victory. We belong to the victor. We belong to the one who has conquered Satan. We have been baptized into his name, into the name of the triune God. We have renounced the devil and all his works and all his ways. Yes, Satan and the fallen angels, they know their eternal destiny. They know their time is short. But until the last day, they are going to still come after you and me. Send trials and troubles. Afflict, lie, and deceive. But indeed, we have the angels, God's holy angels with us. For indeed, our struggle ultimately is not against flesh and blood, but against these unseen fallen angels, these unseen unholy spirits. But how wonderful it is. For Christ has conquered Satan. And when these unholy spirits come after you, you have the Holy Spirit who is greater and more powerful than any of these unholy spirits. And you have the holy angels who are constantly serving you. And so we pray every morning and evening. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Hymn 522.
reading from the Psalms. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague shall come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On to their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Do you have a guardian angel? We know that the angels guard and protect. We know, Jesus teaches us, that there are angels guarding and protecting the little children. And that even as the angels do this, at the same time, the angels are also beholding the face of our Father who is in heaven. But do you actually have an angel assigned to you night and day. Well, actually, there's enough angels for every believer to have their own angel. Again, the number is countless, myriads upon myriads. The uncountable number times the uncountable number is what myriads upon myriads means. But yet, we don't know for sure on the basis of the Word of God if we actually have a particular angel that is assigned to us our complete and entire earthly journey. But what I would like to submit to you is the word that we just heard from Psalm 91 is even more glorious than having a personal guardian angel when we think about the angels guarding and protecting us. Listen to these words. God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Now, we can't really dig into the richness of this verse without going back to Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament. Because in this verse in the Old Testament, the word you is singular. One person. And angels are in the plural. That means every moment that you are on this earth, not just one angel is watching over you and guarding you and protecting you. No, angels, plural, are guarding you and watching over you. Indeed, watching over you, guarding you and protecting you, even as that old ancient foe is attacking, guarding and protecting you in both body and soul. Many times when angels are portrayed in art, they are portrayed as being cute, cuddly, even precious. But realize angels are God's warriors. The angels are God's soldiers. The angels are God's army. When we use the word of the angels, Sabaoth and heavenly hosts, those words are mean, an army. Because you see, you and I don't need angels that are cute and cuddly and precious to guard and protect us. No, we need mighty warriors. We need soldiers. And of course, God doesn't need the angels to guard and protect him. He's the all-powerful God. And so he deploys his angels to guard and protect us. And so we can live in that confidence that 
each and every moment of our lives, there are angels watching over us, guarding and protecting us. Until the last day, when Christ comes with his holy angels in glory, and on that great and glorious day, all the dead will be raised, and the angels will gather from the four winds, you and me and every other believer. And then, us, all believers, all the angels, will worship and praise our glorious Savior and King for all eternity. Hymn 521.